Hi, this is Jessica DeMassa at Frontiers Health, and I'm here with Peter. Peter, please introduce yourself for everyone watching. I'm Peter Cook, um, the Managing Director of Human Dynamics and the Academy of Rock, blending business, intelligence, and music. I love the fact that you blend those two things together, and that's such an unusual combination here at a healthcare conference. So um, tell us a little bit about how organizations can really infuse a culture of creativity and innovation um, with their teams. People often think that it's about having brainstorming tools to, you know, if we spread those around in an organization, life will get better. All you need is a flip chart, right? All you need is a flip <laughs> chart and six thinking hats. Uh -huh. That does help, but it is temporary. It will develop a climate of innovation temporarily for a team that needs some great ideas. And brainstorming done well improves the efficiency of sort of creative thinking and conversion into innovation. But what you asked about was how do you create a culture where innovation is more frequent right. and you know better innovation, you know, so better ideas and more frequently happening. And that's what a lot of organisations want. I was very lucky to have interviewed Richard Branson for mm -hmm. my latest book where he talked about the things that he did in Virgin that inculcate a culture of innovation where it's just a natural phenomenon rather than a sort of stuck on thing. Techniques play their role, but in fact you do need this culture and it really comes down to what you might call HR leadership practices okay. of how you hire great people, trust them to, to bring their brains to work, mm -hmm. all of them, you know, make sure they're encouraged and supported. It's a humanistic leadership practices and behaviours are more important than didactic, you know, do what I say. If you say the great companies that do this sort of do this naturally, but of course you can apply the techniques. Richard has interesting reward and recognition schemes to encourage a pull through the organisation, getting people to, for example, seek forgiveness and not permission. <laughs> so one woman suggested that they should have virgin brides, and, and Richard thought, what a great idea, and it flopped. Oh. And the other point, of course, if you're going to have a culture of innovation, one does need, therefore, to forgive people for occasionally failing, not repetitive, mm -hmm. uh, but Richard's had his fair share of, of failures, including sure. ones he's imposed upon himself, <laughs> like when uh, Virgin decided to take over the world of Coca-Cola. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, they took advice and said, you've got to do it big in America, so they, he hired a Sherman tank to drive down the front of the boulevard and crush loads of cans of Coke. Now, you'd think that was a marvellous publicity stunt to launch your brand, and it was, except Coke were unmoved by the whole moment, and Richard realised he didn't understand the procurement power of Coca-Cola. Right. They just phoned up all the suppliers and said, we made too much Coke, can we put it on your shelves, please? And they flooded, literally, the market with Coca-Cola for a month, by which time his stunt had been forgotten. forgotten. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about Richard is he's prepared to admit his failures, where most leaders don't lead by example, and I think if people see people saying, look, oops, I did it again, sure. just broke Britney Spears. <laughs> if they see that you fail and you're able to say, look, it happened, it, does in, it sends all the right messages. Mm -hmm. So it's cultural, it it cultural management is really important uh, to, to actually have a continuous culture of innovation. You can do some things with tools. So let me ask you another question too, a little bit differently. So you're a musician, mm -hmm. so and I know you've written about you know music and you've been talking about that here, about what, what you can learn about being innovative and creative from music. So what are some takeaways for that? A couple of takeaways. Um, in music we have a thing called dissonance, which is when notes sort of jar together really badly. Okay. The beginning of Paint It Black has some notes that are too <laughs> close together, and it's beautiful. It, you know, dissonance in music can be used to great advantage in classical music and jazz. Mm -hmm. Musicians use notes that jar to actually create a wonderful, wonderfully different things that are sure. memorable. But in, mu in business, uh, cognitive dissonance is in the ballroom is when everyone smiles at each other at a meeting. Uh -huh. they, go, they go to the toilet and swear about each other. Right. And that costs billions of pounds. So leaders genuinely need to value diversity in, in their, their, their groups and their teams. And that means listening to views that you probably wouldn't have thought of and may not even agree with. And so musicians and great leaders are great at what I call emotional intelligence, which is mm -hmm. being a master of their skills internally, what their professional skills are, and paying attention on the outside. Mm -hmm. Great musicians, you watch them. They're actually they're doing this internal stuff and they're paying Thank attention. You. Great leaders do the same and they're willing to hear views and, and ideas that are contrary 
and out of touch with their own. So there's one. Okay. There's plenty more. Oh, well, th that's a beautiful analogy. I love that. And um, I wanted to ask one last question mm. of you um, while we have you. So obviously we're here at a healthcare conference, and you're the very first musician I've ever spoken with at a healthcare conference. So I mean, from your perspective, and you know, obviously somebody who knows a lot about innovation and business, mm. what can what can the healthcare industry do to really transform uh, for the future? How can they be more innovative? What would you challenge them to do? Well, surprisingly, I, I, I didn't mention this. I was, I'm rock and roll because I'm a musician. I've got two children that cover sex. Uh, but I, work, <laughs> I also have drugs in my background. I work okay. for Wellcome, the pharmaceutical company, oh, okay, and great. scaled up the first human insulin product and the first HIV AIDS drug. So I actually have, you have that background. Have that background. So I've seen old pharma. I've seen old pharma trying to convert to new pharma. And it's a real struggle for them because they have monolithic structures. I mm -hmm. do quite a lot of work for companies like Pfizer and Johnson Johnson and Merck, where they have these bureaucratic structures. But the world of healthware, which we're at, is moving fast. People collaborate with people they don't own. Right. You know, they just get together. And of course, with global uh, collaboration, mm -hmm. the pharma companies don't know quite how to sort of, you know, work with these people. What they tend right. to do is buy the company if they like it. Like, but they need to learn to collaborate much better with people that they don't control in the sense of paying them and owning them. And there are lots of people, I think, that also want to work with large pharma who've got resources to, to offer them. So I think collaboration, and you can learn so much about collaboration from music. And I, you know, I, I've interviewed a few people in Prince's uh, <laughs> outfit, the Sheila Ree and the, the bass player. Sure. And they're really good at collaborating with people that aren't the same as themselves and who they don't own. So there's lots of parallels in that area as well. Mm -hmm. The pharma industry should really listen to a lot more music and understand <laughs> how musicians collaborate. I'm here to help. Wonderful. Well, we want to make sure that it's the new boss that's not the same as the old boss, right? Ah. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for joining us. This is Jessica DeMassa of Frontiers Health. Thank you.